I think it's uh, right to apologize to some of you who came earlier because it would appear that there was some miscommunication again. Uh, some people seem to have been informed that this person was going to be at nine. Uh, I hope we will get this straightened out. Uh, that's it. All of you maybe have contacts in the database of those who invite you so that um, we all have the same information. Because when I tried to find out, it seems because okay, Maria had heard from others, uh, I've not had any direct uh, communication. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, the subject of our engagement. This day is a single one, but nonetheless, quite obviously, a, a very important one, and the one that is uh, keeping our country very engaged at the moment, which is the subject of uh, constitutional amendments that uh, are unstated. Uh, and the process to process them. Uh, this is a matter that has been in the media for some time now, and uh, it is clear, there is no doubt, government intends to move a raft of a point of uh, amendments to the constitution. Uh, but I think of the many and varied amendments that are intended to be moved uh, or to be made in our country, one has been the most catchy and the one that has most engaged our population is the amendment to Article 102B, which deals with qualifications uh, of a president or a candidate for president, someone to be elected president, and the limitations imposed by that Article 102, that one should not be above the age of 75 years. Now, uh, the debate, uh, quite obviously, has been should it happen, should it not happen? How should it happen? Should we go to the parliament? Should we go to the referendum? Should we? There are all these debates that uh, are going on. And um, the reason the country is anxious about these matters must be clear to all that it touches on succession of our leadership as a country. And you all know that since independence, no leader has ever handed over power peacefully to another leader. Every leader has had to be bombed out of office. And whoever comes into office has had to bomb their way into office. And this has created a lot of trauma for the country. Many people have died, many have been maimed, a lot of property destroyed in the changes of leadership. And that is why the 1995 Constitution had taken great pain to include some checks to uh, the office of the president that would engender peaceful handover of power. Now, however, I think we all know that many of those checks have already been thrown aside. Other aspects of the Constitution, too, have been changed. And uh, it seems like there is uh, worry that the remaining check may also be removed. So we want to be clear about where our constitution 
has come from and what will happen to it. You cannot understand what is going on unless you understand how a state is created and the constitution for that state is made. Uganda was made a state by the Berlin through the Berlin Conference of 1885, uh, where Europeans they are fighting for control of African territory. And the Berlin Conference granted territorial sovereignty to the Europeans who were controlling various parts of Africa. It, it legitimized the takeover, the capture of African territory by Europeans. <clears throat> uh, what the Europeans were doing then is not different from organized crime. Forcefully taking over control of an area and requiring everybody within that area to seek your protection. And then you control the taxation and wealth in that area. What legitimized the action was the Berlin uh, Conference, legitimized, of course, in the courts. Now, therefore, we lose sight of the constitutional problems we have if we do not clearly focus on how our constitution has developed. The law that created Uganda was imposed by force. The British established rule over Uganda by force. We all lost citizenship. We became subjects of the Queen of England by force. And we had nations here. We had actually modern states in Uganda. Uganda was a modern state with modern institutions. But all these were displaced and a new state was formed by force. And Ugandans lost their power to decide anything in Uganda by force. Lost power over institutions of the state and obviously lost power over the wealth of our country. When Ugandans agitated to remove the British, and there was a lot of agitation, which is why we pay a lot of tribute to the pro-independence activists, there was a lot of agitation. And because Britain was a small island, they could not contain the agitation from all its uh, colonies. So they decided to change tactic and withdraw, make a tactical withdraw, hand over the instruments they used to control us to other people through whom they would control us. The guns were handed to black faces. And the black faces continued to use the guns to dominate the countries that had been dominated by the, 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 the foreigners. So, although there was an attempt at 1962 to create a Ugandan constitution, different ethnic groups were represented in the constitution making process of our independence constitution and of course the facilitation of the British. The 1962 constitution had no chance because those who were making it did not have the power. And that's why it was shortly overthrown. The 62 constitution was overthrown by guns. And from that time, every armed group that takes charge of the country comes with its constitution. The present constitution of 1995 was started as a hopeful process where 
a lot of consultation went into the making of that constitution through the Odoki Commission. And a draft constitution was made arising out of the views that were expressed by Ugandans. And for you who are a little young, it will serve you well to go back and get copies of the sources of information that created the 1995 constitution. There are books, there are volumes of books which are there, which show what people suggested to be in our constitution. And what was suggested was reduced into a draft constitution. The draft constitution was to be debated by the constituent assembly. That's where the trouble began, the constituent assembly. Then Mr. Museven sabotaged the constitution making process of 1995. Whereas it was said people could stand on individual merit to become CA delegates. Museven made separate committees in every district. And I know all these committees that were made because we were still in the movement. Made separate committees to select people that would come to the CA whom then they use state funds and state machinery to get elected or rigged into the CA. So the CA delegates, the CA was a rigged house. And I wrote a lot on this in the document that was controversial of 1999. Now, Within the CA, Museven went further to rig the CA process by appointing CA delegates to become ministers, to become vice president. That's how Kazuwe, Kazuwe was a CA delegate when she was appointed vice president. The prime minister was appointed from a CA delegate to prime minister. The ministers who were just elected as CA delegates were now co-opted into the executive. And those who were not given ministerial positions were now all being quietly told they are on the next list. So the CA delegate was manipulated, was rigged, include things that should never have been there and to exclude things that should have been there, which had come out of the people's views. That is because the people who had the power would not allow the ordinary people to make their constitution. So that's how we had provisions stopping the parties from functioning uh, and other obnoxious provisions that were in that constitution. However, because of the way uh, the process was conducted, some of the people in the Constituent Assembly struggled hard to create mechanisms that would create checks and balances to the power that was causing problems to our country. And that's how Articles 102 and 105 were part of the Constitution. But when people who make a Constitution have no power, just like I have said, there is no way that constitution will work. It will be changed to the dictates of those who have power. And that's what has been happening since 1995. 205, 102 was removed. The good provisions of decentralization have since been reversed. Uh, the uh, remaining obstacle now to Museven in his life presidency is the age limit, which is now being threatened with removal. So, the important thing to understand here is that once people have no power, they have no constitution. It is those with the power that make constitution. A constitution is a set of principles 
on which the state is based and power is distributed within the state. If you have no power, you don't have anything to distribute in a constitution. Those with the power are the ones who make a constitution. And where it ha others have purported to make one, it has been overthrown. So, the process underway now of amending the constitution will happen. Museveni will continue and amend the constitution. He has the power. The institutions of state, parliament, and other institutions are institutions of those who have power. We've said this many times. They are not institutions of ordinary people. When some of us were in the bush, the war then, we believed, was to defeat those who had guns and hand over power to the people. It couldn't happen. And those of us who thought so clearly were naive. Power is not conferred onto others. Power is acquired. Those who want power acquire it. It's not conferred. So, where are we, therefore, in this process? Since independence, it means ordinary Ugandans, their struggle <clears throat> is to regain power so that they can make their constitution. Before they regain power, it's an illusion to think they will have a constitution. And that struggle has been intense and going on. Uh, our message, those of us who have been fighting for democracy, to the people of Uganda, has been precisely about Ugandans standing up and regaining their power. And um, it has been a subtle process, but a lot has already been achieved in terms of Ugandans knowing what to do. That is why in the last election you saw what you saw. Ugandans coming up in huge numbers and contributing their mega resources to try and cause change. In ordinary politics, those who are seeking offices and so on give people money, facilitate others. But now, Ugandans, because they know that it is their own struggle to reclaim their country, they are willing to make sacrifices. And that is indeed why we believe, without any shade of doubt, that in the last 2016 elections we won the election and we have evidence over that but because we were not adequately organized that win was overthrown by the same guns um, and as you know I have made it very clear that what happened last year was an act of treason by Mr. Museveni. Overthrowing people's authority by guns is what is called treason. You know? Um, you know, some people I have heard saying, but the court said he was validly elected. The court only acts on what is before them. Everybody knows that I could not go to court because I was under illegal detention. Uh, now, the court could not, unless moved otherwise, rule on my illegal detention, and it later on did. In September, long after Museveni had been sworn in, the court ruled that I was under illegal detention. But things had already happened. But that ruling is there, that I was under illegal detention. So. Mr. Museveni captured power 
through use of guns in 1986. It was not through people's consent. The NRM regime captured power by force last year. Both ways, whether through 1996, 86, or through 2016, the cordon to power by the NRM regime has not been through people's consent and will. So the critical thing now is how do we get a new constitution? A new constitution can, or amendments to the constitution cannot be made by an illegitimate body. The NRM regime is illegitimate. It cannot make a lasting Ugandan constitution. The next constitution must be made through a transitional process. And there are many things that require a new consensus in our country. They have to be undertaken through a transitional process. After the NRM and Museveni Junta has relinquished that power. The task at hand, therefore, for all Ugandans is to work for the transition through which we can have a new consensus for our country. And working for that transition will require a number of things to be done by all of us. First, it is the duty of all of you us, all Ugandans, to awaken those who are not aware that Uganda is a captive state, that those who hold and have held power in Uganda since colonial rule have done so without our consent, and that if we want have control over the country, control over Uganda's institutions, control over Uganda's wealth, we must regain power. That is the first thing that every person ought to appreciate. Two, it is also to understand that to regain that power, we, the people of Uganda, must have sufficient coordination in order to act together, to speak together, to act together in taking actions that will reclaim our power. So we need to have organizational networks that link us on this matter, on this subject. You may have seen that, you know, even when we all appreciate that we are in this situation, some people pulling that way, others pulling this way. Uh, and we say we want to reclaim the country. The activities of last weekend where you saw the Lord Mayor here being harassed is... Uh, uh, you know, a sad indicator of what I am talking about. We need to harmonize what needs to be done and have networks that focus on what needs to be done. Thirdly, we must take actions that disempower the regime, that disempower the dictatorship, Actions that can be taken individually or in concert. Every person, wherever they are, they can take actions and as, an, as individuals. But there are actions which we will need to take collectively, as small groups or even as uh, 
uh, whole communities. And uh, in taking these actions, we also would like to invite people who are in the civil service, people who are in the armed service, who are holding guns, their guns being used to subvert the country, people who are in civil society, including religious leaders and other persons in the civil society, to all rally and we all take actions that return our country to a democratic rule. And all of us to work for the transition. The single thing that we must work for is the transition in which a new constitutional order is undertaken. The other actions that we need and must take are actions that we will have to take together, and we have many actions in this regard. But we, we are still coordinating with all other pro-transition activists, people who want a transition to a democratic dispensation. We are coordinating with all the transition activists to harmonize the broader actions that we will be taking together. People who are talking about having an election <coughs> or a vote on any of the constitutional matters, whether in the parliament or a referendum, are lending themselves to be used to legitimize what is wrong. Arising out of the 2016 elections, Many scholars and activists actually conducted far-reaching research and have published a book called Controlling Concept. This is a very important record, I think, for our country. It is Uganda's 2016 elections, Controlling Concept. What is contained here, and of course in other areas, clearly shows that those who capture power by force then use state institutions to control how people consent to what they say. <clears throat> they create uh, all kinds of political uh, uh, mas maneuvers and gimmicks portray an image that people are participating and are, are consenting. That is what they call controlling consent. Using the people to advance their own agendas when people have nothing to do with what they are doing. Idi Amin, when he was declared life president, it is not him who declared himself life president. He organized the people of Uganda to declare him a life president. And he said, they are, and they crowned him and said, you know, this is what we want, and the people of Uganda have said, you have done great things for Uganda, become a life president. Certainly, people of Uganda did not want a minute to become a life president, as it was later on seen. So, we need to desist the temptation 
for the regime to appear as if it is calling for people's views on these matters. Because Mr. Tafiri and others are going saying, but it is not us. We want to put up a commission that seeks views from the people. Any process that is done, whether people give views or don't, will end up providing what the one with the power needs. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the whole idea of uh, a referendum when all systems that manage a referendum or an election are in the hands of a dictator is simply providing an avenue for them to say, you see, the people have spoken. Uh, and Mr. Museven should know this best more than anybody else. Because that's why he went to war. There was a parliament in 1986. A parliament had just been elected. He was defeated by Sam Kutesa. Sam Kutesa was in the parliament. If he had views, why didn't he pass them through Sam Kutesa, his MP, and let the parliament debate <laughs> and, uh, and decide on a new thing? Museveni knew that the parliament was simply a rubber stamp of those who had guns. That's why he did not subject himself to parliament. But now he wants everybody to believe that this parliament has power. It can speak on behalf of the people. That now elections are not controlled. When he who captured power by force is the one organizing those elections about himself, not about anybody else. So, the way forward, as we recommend, is that all pro-democracy forces should focus on terminating control of power by the NRM job. And then we have a transition. The transition will have five elements that we envision. One should be a transition of a broad base of a national a, a government of a national unity. The, a transition should be a government of a national unity. The work of the government of national unity should be to do four things. One, negotiate a new consensus for the people of Uganda to have a constitution. Mr. Daniel Mulika, the former Katikri of Uganda, has been advocating over this matter for a long time. Say He wrote a concept paper talking about the consent the people of Uganda had in 62 that was overthrown, which is true. The 15 nations that made the consent was overthrown. He's been saying we must have a new consensus, which is true. But you can't have a consensus unless you have a transition. You cannot have a, consen a new consensus under a dictatorship. So the first task of a transition is making a new constitution. The second task is rebuilding state institutions. So that they are now institutions controlled by the new people who have power, by the ordinary people. We must have a new security system, not new individuals. The individuals can be there. They are not saying we will abolish. There should be an abolition of people who are serving. But they must be reconstituted so that they reflect a national character so that they are accountable, 
saw that uh, they, uh, they, they are professional, they depend on meritocracy, they are professional in nature, uh, and other attributes. So rebuilding of state institutions, the courts of law, just like the Kenyans did, have transparent processes for having new judicial institutions and other institutions of state. Three, to have a period of reconciling the country. Because we have a country whose communities have deep wounds as a result of violations of people's rights that has taken place in this country over the years from independence. Different communities have different wounds. Uganda has its wounds. People of northern Uganda have their deep wounds. People of Kasese have their wounds. People of Eastern Uganda have their wounds. Western, so everybody has his own wounds. We need a process that will lead to a, a new beginning. That's a reconciliation process. And reconciliation obviously entails finding out the truth of what happened. And also having some processes of justice so that we have a new beginning. And lastly, free and fair elections. In other words, you cannot talk about free and fair elections without a new constitutional framework. Institutional framework. A framework of institutions that can fairly manage political processes. And um, uh, free and fair elections would then conclude a transition to an open and democratic uh, process. So this is where our struggle is centered. It is all interlinked. The people's government, as you have heard, one of its tasks is to reassert people's will that was expressed last year. And we have made it very clear, even before that election, that there would have to be a transition, government of national unity and the transition. So these. Uh, uh, attempts at trying to, to amend the Constitution here and there, tinker with it, um, tinker with the, uh, the Constitution, mainly to facilitate the wishes of those who hold the country captive, must be fought straight forward and the regime that is holding the country hostage must be uh, that hold on the country must be broken so that we can have a new beginning any other action will be simply delaying that now of course I have talked about having coordination, organization amongst those who seek to work for transition. That networking and organization is not a partisan activity. Every person working for transition must face the same direction. Confusing agents are doing everything in their power to divide our attention. 
bringing this, bringing that. Everybody who wants to fight for democratic transition needs to focus in the same place and to be in the same network. That doesn't mean that parties have no role in the democratization process. In fact, parties are extremely essential for democracy. But we all know that parties want to be built, want to be strong under the dictatorship. So the earnest time to fully build these institutions is in the transitional period. They can do what they can as of now, but this is not the time for partisan competition. Absolutely not. And on this, actually, I again applaud the people of Uganda because I think the people of Uganda have are ahead of many of our leaders. Even when we go to compete with our parties and flags and so on, the people just look for that one who will best continue with the struggle. They all run on that regardless of the parties. That's what has been happening in all these elections. Uh, today, my brother Chagulan is going to be sworn in. You know, we told the people of Chadondo, you maintain the one you elected last time, because they are the ones who elected the Kantint. See, the Kantint was not removed by you, was not removed by uh, anything wrong he did. You maintain him, we, we advocated to them. For them, they looked and said, no, we want this one. And all of them, whether you, the FDC, whether DP, whether what, they all rallied on one country. That is uh, uh, a spirit that people have already identified. What they are struggling for now is not partisan interest. What they are struggling for now is regaining their country. And... Um, and that is why also anybody who veers off their struggle, they lose interest in them. Sometimes when people support you, you think it is me they are interested in. Not at all. People are not interested in BSJ, in Chagulani, in the, they are not. They are interested in getting power and using that power for their well-being. Who they see, he will help them to get that power. They run around so that you help them to get that power. When they run around you and they see you are not sure where you are going, they abandon you and <laughs> go follow those they think are kumulamwa, as they say in Uganda. If you are not on kumulamwa, you, you get lost. They continue struggling. So the mulamwa the, of our struggle is a transition from armed rule, from military control, subordinating the military, subordinating the institutions of state to the people. And anybody who works for that, we all should work together. I think that uh, is, we've written a document to, to, to explain this in a little more detail, which you are all going to be given, uh, so that uh, if you want to quote what we are saying, you have something to refer to, because these are very, very important matters of state formation and building, uh, and uh, putting them on record important. So there is a, a record you are going to be given of what we've said. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, now we shall take the